The Miller-Urey experiment was a total failure. It never produced any life and was based on incorrect assertions about the ancient atmosphere, which was obviously oxidizing. In addition to producing an equal amount of left and right-handed amino acids, which are poison to each other, it mostly produced a melanoid and enzyme tar, which destroys amino acids. Every experiment since then using the correct atmosphere has also failed. I remember learning about the Miller-Urey experiment in high school. I thought it was fascinating. So when I heard this argument, I was even more interested. This prompted me to investigate. The Miller-Urey experiment was designed as a test of one of Alexander Oparin's theories about the origin of life. In 1922, Oparin deduced that the early Earth had a reducing atmosphere consisting of methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and water vapor, and that those four chemicals alone can, through some sort of natural means, yield the chemical precursors to life. Oprin's theories were further expanded by John Burden Sanderson Haldane in his 1929 article in the Rationalist Annual entitled The Origin of Life. In the article, Haldane went so far as to conclude that the early atmosphere actually favored the formation of complex organic compounds. In 1952, Harold Urey published a book called The Planets, Their Origin and Development. Urey had previously been involved with the Manhattan Project and, in 1934, had earned a Nobel Prize in chemistry for his discovery of deuterium. In his book, Urey also determined that the early atmosphere consisted of methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. In 1953, one of Urey's graduate students, Stanley Miller, formulated a means by which to test the theories of Oparin and Haldane. In Miller's words, in order to test this hypothesis, an apparatus was built to circulate methane, ammonia, water, and hydrogen passed an electric discharge. Water is boiled in the flask, mixes with the gases in the flask, circulates past the electrodes, condenses, and empties back into the boiling flask. The acids and amino acids formed in the discharge, not being volatile, accumulate in the water phase. Miller could easily have devised a more certain method for synthesizing amino acids. He specifically wanted to test Oprin's hypothesis. In this apparatus, an attempt was made to duplicate a primitive atmosphere of Earth and not to obtain the optimum conditions for the formation of amino acids. He ran the experiment for a full week. During the run, the water in the flask became noticeably pink after the first day, and by the end of the week, the solution was deep red and turbid. What Miller found in the flask were 11 of the 20 amino acids which are the basis of all life on Earth. This was a tangible confirmation of the predictions made by Oprin, Haldane, and Urey. It wasn't life, but it was never meant to produce life. The experiment produced both left and right-handed amino acids, which don't react with each other at all. They simply pass by each other unaffected. Nearly all life is based on left-handed amino acids, but a few organisms, such as some column bacteria, do utilize and produce right-handed amino acids. Taking up from Miller's work, several other scientists fashioned their own experiments. That same year, actually before Miller's publication, Woolman McNevin passed 100,000 volt sparks through methane and water vapor and produce resinous solids that were too complex for analysis. Joan Oro synthesized the nucleotide base adenine from hydrogen cyanide and ammonia in a water solution. Several other experiments modeled after Miller-Urey contained and expanded it by substituting various chemicals with the results showing that complex chemistry could be synthesized via a large number of methods in a large number of conditions. When Miller died in 2007, his student, Professor Jeffrey Botta, inherited his equipment and his sealed vials. Botta and other researchers used more modern equipment to inspect the vials and discovered 25 more amino acids than Miller had been aware of. Botta estimated there would be up to 40 more, but research has been discontinued for now. However, if the main precipitants had been melanoids or enzymes, which break down amino acids, after more than 50 years, none of those amino acids should have remained in the vials. In 2008, one full year after Miller's death, 
A group of scientists examined 11 vials left over from all of his experiments in the 50s. Most notably, an experiment simulating volcanic activity, which yielded 22 amino acids, 5 amines, and many hydroxylated molecules. In the years since the Miller-Urey experiment, science has gained more knowledge of the Earth's early atmosphere. If there was an oxidizing atmosphere at the time, it couldn't have been anything like today's atmosphere. The clue to this is the lack of oxidation present in any rocks from that period of time. On the other hand, we may never completely be sure of what the actual atmosphere was. As it turns out, we may never need to be. On September 28, 1969, a meteor hit the Earth near the town of Murchison, Victoria in Australia. The Murchison meteorite, as it came to be called, contained over 90 different types of amino acids, including 19 of those needed for life as we know it. The majority of them were the left-handed variety due to polarized UV light in space. Additionally, cometary debris is often found to contain complex organic compounds like formamide. So if there is perhaps a real failing in the Miller-Urey experiment, it's not in what it produced, but in its potential irrelevance, as there may be no need for complex organic chemistry to have ever formed on Earth in the first place. Building from this, on December 8, 2014, the Proceedings of the National Academy published the results of an experiment conducted by Svatopluk Sivis and several others. In the experiment, a high-powered laser was used to heat samples of clay saturated with formamide, producing roughly a billion kilograms kilowatts of energy to simulate the extreme heat of an asteroid impact. The experiment produced all four nucleotide bases needed for RNA. Weeks before, on November 20th, 2014, Jonathan Schipanzi and Gerald Joyce published a paper in the journal Nature chronicling an experiment utilizing left and right-handed RNA molecules. They inserted a pool of random right-handed RNA molecules in a test tube with left-handed molecules and isolated whatever promising chains developed. They found right-handed chains that reproduced as left-handed chains and then back again. After 16 generations, the RNA actually evolved, becoming more and more efficient at replicating itself. This experiment showed that not only are left and right handed amino acids not obstructors to each other, but they may even be necessary for the origin of life on Earth. These replicators have continued to evolve and improve since the paper was published, but as of this production, those developments haven't been published yet. Long before, in 1932, Dutch chemist H.G. Bungenborg de Jong began investigating the formation of coacervates, colloidal droplets held together by electrostatic attractive forces and which form in a variety of conditions. These form an isolated environment and selectively absorb simple organic molecules from the outside world, essentially constituting a basic metabolism. This led to the proposal that metabolism may have evolved before reproduction. However, between 1965 and 1972, Sidney Fox published multiple articles chronicling his work with what he dubbed microspheres. Essentially, Fox and others submerged amino acids and protonoids in water and saline solutions and then heated them. In as little as 20 minutes, Minutes, their experiments yielded microspheres, which also began asexually dividing via binary fission. They even developed a double membrane corresponding to a bilipid layer in a living cell. Life has never been created in a lab. No one has ever tried. But with the synthesis of RNA and inheritance coupled with basic metabolism and reproducing protocells, the most definitive features required for life have all been shown to form in conditions simulating the natural world. While investigating the Miller-Urey experiment, I discovered how meticulously experiments are conducted. Every variable is accounted for. Controls are specifically designed to regulate and record which conditions account for the results. The Miller-Urey experiment may or may not have demonstrated how the basic chemical constituents of life formed on Earth, but it was among the first in a continuous series of experiments showing that they don't require a miracle to appear. And that is a perfect example of how creationism taught me real science. Learn more about the real science behind other creationist arguments by watching other episodes. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may be the subject of a later video. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.